Um, many of you know that I'm a Harvard fan. No. <laughs> we will not comment about the game. <laughs> but you'll notice the flowers up here are the colors of Auburn's finest and greatest adversary. Uh, they, are, they are so colored, and the flowers are up here because they are uh, given by uh, uh, Connie, Connie, excuse me, Connie Whitehall. Uh, to celebrate her husband's first birthday in heaven, Norman Blackwell. Um, and everybody who knows him or knew him uh, knew that he was a great Alabama fan. Now I know that many of you are great football fans. Uh, those of you who share my football with you are no doubt depressed. Uh, those of you who cheer for Norman's team are suffering from the after effects of cardiac arrest. <laughs> Uh, I don't know anything about the uh, Mississippi State people and the LSU people or poorly dressed, but <sighs> did you see those uniforms they had yesterday? Anyway. All right. First, Second Timothy 3, verse 14. Second Timothy 3, verse 14. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of, because you know those from whom you learned it. And how from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped and thoroughly equipped for every good work. Verse 4 1. Chapter 4 1. The presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing in his kingdom, I give you this charge. <coughs> Preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. But you, keep your head in all situations, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, and discharge all the duties of your ministry. This is the word of God for the people of God and all God's people said. Have you ever messed up? And I don't mean morally. I mean stupid. <laughs> Have you ever messed up stupid? Have you ever committed acts below your pay grade stupid? I have. The good news is, is these situations and these mistakes are redeemable. And I have found often that they are redeemable not only through the grace of God, but by the action of a singular type of person that person being, or that type of person being, a mentor or a coach. Now, what mentors have you had in your life? I've had a lot. My parents were great ones. I've had teachers at all levels that were great mentors. I've had good pastors who discipled and coached me. One of the most colorful mentors I have ever had is, she's still alive, the great Mary Nell Gaunt. Isn't that a name? She was my high school chemistry teacher. She was tough. She was very, very tough, and her toughness would manifest itself through her somewhat eccentric sense of humor. She liked to portray herself as the maniacal, mad, and sometimes even mean chemistry teacher. She graded our papers with a huge red pen filled with red ink and referred to her grading process as bleeding on our papers. <laughs> She claimed that the red ink for this pen came from the veins of her lab assistants. <laughs> Needless to say, she was colorful. In 1983, Ms. Gaunts was one of the first winners of the Presidential Awards for Excellence in Teaching in Science and Mathematics. She got to meet President Reagan and was given a guided tour of the Smithsonian Institute. It was a big deal back then. Um, now here's the fine point of all this. All of these coaches, all of these mentors who made a difference in my life and yours, I think they had several things in common, but for me, one of the biggest things 
or the biggest thing, was they encouraged me in a very singular way. They encouraged me without giving me any permission whatsoever to slack off or to give up. Now, there's a lot of terribly wonderful, kind people out there who will say terribly wonderful, kind things in an attempt to encourage you, okay? But I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the encouragement that comes from a real solid mentor that encourages you never to give up. Now, if I failed, these mentors would deconstruct the failure with me. They would guide me and they would unleash me again. And if I did something that wasn't fair, or that was just plain stupid, they would look me in the eye and they would say, Trav, what were you thinking? I nearly failed the stoichiometry test in Mrs. Gauntz's chemistry class. How many of you remember what stoichiometry is? You like two. 8.30 knows stoichiometry better than y'all. Just remember that. Okay. Um, I nearly failed. I think I got a, sort of a high D. I think it was a 68 or something like that. And this gaunts, I, I asked to talk with her after it was all over. And she looked at me. She had blood in her eye. Uh, she had this weird set to her jaw. Okay. And I didn't, I didn't mess up the test because I hadn't studied. I messed up because I did stupid things. Okay. But... She looked at me like that nobody had before and nobody had since. But she got it, she said this a long time ago. She, she got into education. She, she used to have a job in a chem lab. She was a really good chemist. And she got into education because she wanted to invest in people and affect people. So this blood in her eye fades and her jaw relaxes and we just deconstructed the failure. And I did not make those mistakes ever again to the point that she actually allowed me in her AP chemistry class, and she permitted me to be one of those lab assistants. Just to note, the thing about the blood from the veins of the lab assistants, that was an exaggeration. She never tapped my veins for any reason. Anyway, even though I caused her exasperation with some of my performance in class, her actions said to me, Trav, you can do this. This is what you need to do, now go. And that was a mentor, that was a coach talking there. Now the great coach that Timothy had was Paul. If you read the entire letter of 2 Timothy, and I urge you to do that, primarily, a lot of us are really busy. If you go to BibleGateway.com, they have at least the New International Version is on audio. You can access this through mobile devices and things like that. But listening to the entire letter of 2 Timothy is just 15 minutes, okay? And it's not a quick reading. It's a dramatic reason with a reading with dramatic pauses and things like that. 16 minutes tops. You can hear how he is mentoring, Paul is, mentoring Timothy. And he's a mentor that's at a different time of life, okay? He's coaching Timothy and everything, but he's a mentor, he's a coach that's playing his last game. And he's trying to leave everything on the field. He's making sure that Timothy can carry on the ministry for which they are both dedicated. Now, what is Paul's state at this time? He's in chains, uh, nearly certain that he is in Rome, awaiting his execution. He is only 52 years old. Now, most people think, wow, uh, I thought Paul lived to be like 80 or 90 or something, and then they locked his head off. No. Paul was born, based on statements that are made in the book of Acts, Paul was born, as near as we can tell, about 10 AD. And he was executed, as near as we can tell, somewhere between 60 and 62 AD. He might have been only 50 years old when he was martyred. Now, by this time, uh, several Christians had abandoned him. Non-Christians had abandoned him, abused him. Uh, it was physically cold. It was probably somewhere a little bit later in this time of year. Uh, when the leaves start really falling. And you can find this from some of the information in the later part of the letter. He had left his cloak in western Turkey. Uh, and he, in a region called Troas. And he knows that winter is coming, literally and metaphorically. And what will he say, not just to Timothy here, but to us? Because these words are not just to Timothy, they are to us. They are good coaching, they are good encouragement for the life we have to live with faith in Jesus Christ. Paul mentors and coaches us here for three things at least. 
I think he mentors us in continuing and correcting and connecting. Continuing, correcting, and connecting. The first is continuing. Paul says this, but as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of. What does the scripture teach us? You know, I could preach an entire sermon on this verse alone, and perhaps I should one day. But have you ever asked a teacher or a mentor a question and they reply like this? Well, to fully answer that question requires another lecture. Have you ever, has that ever happened to you? I can't hear you. Come on. Yes. Good. Okay. What is that code for? Now you will know. It is code that you should not be intellectually lazy if you're going to ask questions like that. If you ask a mentor or a teacher a question like that and they respond like that, but you should take your question beyond the answer that they give in three to five minutes. People who just download what the teacher says, what the mentor says, what the preacher says, truly, really need to find some motivation. They're intellectually lazy. Ladies and gentlemen, if you're going to be a Christian, you have to learn what it means. And some of that happens in Sunday morning through music. Praise God for the youth choir, for Catherine and Kirk's and Jennifer's leadership. It happens through worship. It happens through teaching and preaching. However, you must have the self-initiative to teach yourself if you're going to completely fulfill the command of Christ, and that is to disciple others. We talked about this in the New Folk Sunday School class here in the sanctuary at 945. What is the purpose of an apple tree? Seriously, what's the purpose of an apple tree? To make apples. Okay, does anybody else want to stab a guess? Shade. To what? Shade. Shade? Good. Actually, the purpose of an apple tree is to make other apple trees. I'm sorry, but the apple does not sit around thinking about how much shade you need and how much fruit you need. It actually produces the shade and the fruit so that it will tempt animals to scatter the seeds of the apple tree for the purpose of making other apple trees. It's exactly the same with Christians. Christians, it's neat that we produce spiritual fruit. It's one of our purposes. We produce, hopefully, a rest in the sanctuary and shade from the world. And we produce spiritual fruit and nourishment for people, not only for Christians and non-Christians, but the purpose of a Christian is to produce other Christians and not necessarily biologically through reproduction. It is to be discipled such that we can disciple others, including your children. The world and the school system will never make your children Christian. As a matter of fact, a lot of school systems these days expressly that is against their purpose. You have to pray to God for spiritual hunger to leap forward and to study and to practice the gospel of Christ like a starving man on a Christmas ham, like the football movie says. Continuing in what you have learned, how can you continue if you haven't learned it? Paul also says, continue in what you've been convinced of. Has the Lord convinced you of the gospel of Christ? You know, we publicly confess our faith in Jesus Christ every Sunday here using the Apostles or the Nicene Creed. If we're not convinced that those words are true, then there's just so much babble. You know, Jesus says really hard things, folks. Jesus says things like this. This is John 3, verse 3. Very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. Now, being born again, I don't know if you realize this or not, but it's a very, very radical change. It goes on, chapter 3, verse 16, the one that we hear all the time at the football games, or at least see all the time at the football games. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. But doesn't it sound wonderful? I mean, that's the gospel in a nutshell. But then there's verse 17 and 18 afterwards that so many people tend to forget. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Verse 18, whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only son. And that's a hard saying, folks. That was as politically incorrect in 2,000 years ago than it is now, as it is now. And here's the hard question. Have you been born again by the power of God so that you are convinced? If not, I pray for that, and I hope that you pray for that, and watch and see what the Lord does in His own time. Now, the second thing is to correct. 
And the world, the world's understanding of correction by Christians today is extremely warped, primarily because Christians have not been practicing it well. I'll get to that in a minute. Paul says this, I give you this charge, preach the word, be prepared in season and out of season, correct, rebuke, encourage, with great patience and careful instruction. Most people hear the word correct or rebuke or anything like that. And saying those words with great patience and careful instructions is just sort of an oxymoron. But Paul obviously means us to be able to correct and rebuke with great patience and careful instruction. You may say, Trav, this sounds like words that are just for preachers. And I would say to you that if you think that, then you are wildly unaware of the history of the Methodist revival or any high-functioning revival in church history, which gave birth to the Christian people among which you now sit. If we have learned the gospel and have been convinced of it, then we are not merely destined to sit in this room and sing songs of the sweet by and by, although they're great. It doesn't mean we don't worship. But we're called to be salt and light in the world. Then there's darkness and shadow incarnate marching all over the earth. And salvation will not be found in going back to the 1950s. Salvation will not be found in going back even to the 1980s, nor will it be found in the false utopias of socialism or the free market. Salvation is found only in Jesus Christ. And he marched into the world to heal and to save and not condemn. And his suffering on the cross was a sign that God was not above the suffering of the world, that he was going to touch it, that he was going to experience it, that he was going to drink it like gall and then rise from the dead and then do everything he cared to, about it, to do about it. And we are his hands and feet in this great cause. Sign me up for that cause, my friends. Have you signed up? Or is your calendar so clotted with things that would never make an eternal difference? Now why? Third thing is connect. Why should we continue and correct? Paul says this, For the time is coming when people will not put up with sound doctrine. That must mean that Christian doctrine is pretty important. We can't just go trotting off believing whatever it is we want to. Instead, to suit their own desires, they, would, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. You know, he's not talking about the world here, folks. He's talking about the church. And unless you are following the news, unless you aren't following the news, we are in the middle of this situation right now. And not just in the things and the controversies that you might think. One of the greatest heresies today is that in the eyes of many Christians, the church is merely little more than a spiritual service provider like Walmart or Kmart, where people come to be served rather than serve, and all of us serving the Lord together. Where are you called to serve? Only the Lord can tell you that, and, but in whatever circumstance, Paul says this, verse 5 of today's scripture, verse chapter 4, verse 5. Keep your head in all situations, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, discharge all the duties of your ministry. Then you may ask, what is the work of an evangelist? What are the duties of my ministry? To which I refer to the first moments of this sermon. To fully answer that will take another lecture or another sermon. So go after it yourself. Now that I've preached all that, you may ask, Trav, where is the encouragement? I thought this sermon was about encouragement. It is. These words from Paul are the encouragement for which we all long. How can I say that? Deep in your souls, deep in our souls, we don't long for shallow pats on the back or a shot of groovy Jesus juice that will get us through the week. Although pats on the back are great. I'm not saying don't pat people on the back. Instinctively, we know that all of that can be spiritually unsustainable nonsense. We long for serious mentors who will direct us to follow Jesus. We have fitness coaches. We have professional development coaches. We have football coaches. As I understand it, we even have chess coaches, fashion coaches, and image coaches. God help us all. Yet where are the spiritual coaches? Where are our spiritual mentors? 
You may have come here on fire for Jesus Christ. If so, first, continue in what you have been convinced of and learned of. Correct. Be a light to the world with great patience and careful instruction. Do not be a judgmental ninny. And third, connect for the world is in darkness and the light that is within your heart and your mind is there by the power of the Holy Spirit and is meant to be shined, not hid under your basket. Now you may have come here cold. You may have done something spiritually stupid. A shallow mentor would say, oh, you're not stupid. I would like to correct that because I have been stupid. There is hardly a spiritually stupid thing that I haven't done. However, those situations are redeemable and they are redeemable very often, as I have found, by a singular type of person, coach, or a mentor. Now, if you're here and you're spiritually cold, you can start again and get warm. There's nothing like the fire of the Holy Spirit. And if you've been foolish, quit asking yourself what you were doing and turn to a mentor. There are good Christian mentors in this room who surround you. There are mentors in the Bible. Paul was one of them. Paul, I don't know if you've noticed this or not, is dead. He sleeps and waits for the resurrection, of which many of us are convinced of. But mentor, but Paul's mentor, Paul's coach, is alive and well. The one and only Jesus Christ. He's been raised from the dead. He is alive, and you can speak to him right now. Especially, my friends, if you're spiritually lost and you don't know where to go, and you don't know which way is up or down. So in his name, and to reach out and to connect with him, all of us, whether we be cold or on fire, or stupid or lost, May we pray. Heavenly Father, we have not been the people that you would have us be. You have lit fires in some of our hearts. Lord, tell us where to go. Lord, some of us in the room are cold. Light a fire in our hearts. And then tell us where to go. Some of us are stupid and are wondering if we can ever, ever, ever be acceptable in your sight again. And the answer we know is, of course, to light a fire in our heart and send us for it. We're sorry for what we've done, but let's move forward together. And some of us in the room are lost. Holy Spirit, we pray for a hunger for all the lost in this room and that we know. And help us meet more people so that we can meet more lost folks. So that we can help more lost folks be found. Holy Spirit, we ask you to light a fire in everyone here. A fire that cannot be quenched. That we would go forth and be encouraged. That we would go forth and be obedient. That we would go forth and do so buoyantly and joyfully. Out of purpose and conviction and love. We thank you, Lord Jesus. It's in your name that we've gathered here and in your name that we pray. Amen.